Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Theological Leftovers. We haven't been doing the Theological Leftovers quite as much, been doing the good stuff. Um, honestly, I'm just doing whatever kind of um, seems enjoyable at the time. These videos are as much about me as anything else. It gives me an opportunity to share things that I don't have any other place to, to share, not in Bible class, not in sermons, just kind of extra stuff. Um, sometimes it's extra stuff as I'm out and about on a day off, enjoying a beautiful day and, and, and you know, see the evidence of God around me. And I, I like being able to share that stuff today. It's truly theological leftovers, though, in part because I haven't had a whole lot of time. Um, so when I don't have a lot of time to put something um, really involved together, I, I tend to write in my variety of journals just little notes. And I've accumulated some notes that I thought I would share with you that are disjointed, don't necessarily fit together, but but I write them down because I think they're worth remembering, um, and often because I find them either convicting or encouraging, and um, I need both of those things in my life. So do you, so I'm going to share some of them with you now. One of these is from a ways back, and I think I, I think I may have turned it into a little meme at some point, but I never talked about it. I love this. It's from the Large Catechism. Um, it's, I think, the introduction uh, to Martin Luther's large catechism. And um, <laughs> this is this is um, this is one of those things that I, I would probably get terrible blowback on. But but you know how we have church signs and we we have entryways and maybe we put up phrases or Bible verses and and all kinds of things because we want to make a good first impression as people, especially as guests walk into our church. Um, I think this would be a great sign to to put um, as as people are walking into your church building or into your sanctuary. Uh, you may disagree, um, but but this is the introduction. This is as as you enter into the large catechism. This is what what Luther has to say. He says you must all right. So if you think this isn't talking about you, you're misunderstanding Luther. He says you must all become other than you are. And do otherwise than you now do. No matter who you are, and no matter how great, wise, mighty, and holy you may think yourselves, here there is no one godly. I really like the idea of that being a, a, an entryway sign. What do you think? Here there is no one godly. It's, it's a funny thing, you know, when we proclaim law and gospel, when we share with people that they're sinners in need of a Savior, and thanks be to God, that Savior has come. God has become flesh, and he has, he has suffered, and he has died. He has taken on your sins. He's risen from the dead. He's defeated sin, death, and the devil. This is good news that we share, but it, it does, um, I don't know if it rests on this, but it, it, it all starts with an acknowledgement of our sin, and and the fact that our culture is is offended or shocked or surprised when we point out a sin, um, it says more about us maybe even than our culture. Uh, maybe we don't do this clearly and consistently enough. There is no one godly. We're not picking on a particular group of people when we we point out a sin. We say don't do that, or more than that, when we say you need help. Right, you're sinful. You need to be saved from that sin and the death that it causes. It, it, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that we say that. Um, and yet, people feel like they're being picked on. They're being um, pulled out of the crowd, and their sins are being pointed out. And I don't know. Maybe we have been doing that too much in the church. And so Luther's quote is is very good. I think very appropriate. You must all become other than you are and do otherwise than you do, no matter who you are, no matter how great, wise, mighty, and holy you may think yourselves, there is no one godly. And that's why Jesus came for you, because he loves you. And he came to make you a saint by taking on your sin and by giving you his righteousness. This is the message of the church for everybody. So, don't feel like you're being picked on when your sin is pointed out by a faithful pastor or parent. Their whole point is to point you to Jesus and to the salvation that he has won for you. Right? I, I love it. I would, I would not object 
to that being put up somewhere prominently um, here at Concordia. Um, I will probably also not object um, if it's not put up um, because I understand it'll probably cause all kinds of misunderstanding and uh, I don't want that. So anyway, but I hope you appreciate it. Going to keep on going here. I saw this. Um, I was reading the introduction that C.S. Lewis wrote to a book of quotes, and the quotes are all from um, George MacDonald, who was a C.S. Lewis was a big fan of George MacDonald. And I was rereading the introduction to it, and um, I didn't even read the quotes. I just read C.S. Lewis's introduction, and it really had some good stuff in it. He talked about um, one of the things he loved about George MacDonald was he described him as having a passionate love of hard won learning. W O N, hard won learning. The passionate love of hard won learning. And I just, I, I love that phrase. Again, I told you today's theological leftovers, it's just extra stuff. But I love that idea of, of uh, hard won learning. It doesn't all come easy. Sometimes it's difficult to figure things out. It takes hard work, dedication, just like exercise, but for the brain, right? Hard won learning is the best kind of learning the stuff that you've really contended with and struggled to understand. And, and then there's an epiphany, there's revelation, there's, there's understanding. Um, so don't give up too quick. If something seems difficult, plow in, um, work hard uh, to learn, especially as Christians, we need to do this. We need to be at the top of the game um, when it comes to learning. Um, so that's the second one. Third one, this, um, I think I got out of the Treasury of Daily Prayer, which is such an amazing, almost overwhelming resource of material. And um, it's the Augsburg Confession. They're talking about uh, uh, explaining a Cyprian quote. And so Melanchthon is talking about Cyprian. You may not know who either one of those two people are, but he's talking about piety, good Christian, not pietism, but good Christian piety. And he says, piety compares the greatness of God's blessings with the greatness of our ills, our sin, and our death, and it gives thanks. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's his, how he describes piety. Piety compares the greatness of God's blessings with the greatness of our ills, sin, and our death. It compares those two things, and it gives thanks. Because what's greater? What's greater even than my ills, my sin, and my death? What's stronger, more powerful? What's greater? God's blessings. Right? So Christian piety gives thanks. It, it makes that comparison. It sees what's greater, and it rejoices. Right? That's Christian piety. Interesting way of thinking about it, isn't it? Love it. Um, and then I got this one, again, from C.S. Lewis, his introduction. He was talking about uh, moralism. And, um, and, um, let's see, how do I want to do this? He, I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase the quote. Okay. He says, moralism confines goodness to the region of law and duty, right? So he's describing, he's defining moralism. Moralism confines good, what is good to the region of, of law, what you should be doing, right? You want to understand good. This is what you should be doing. He said, that's moralism. Moralism confines goodness to the region of law and duty, which never lets us feel in our face the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness. What an image. I love it. Let me read it again. Moralism confines goodness to the region of law and duty, which never lets us feel in our face the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness. I'm going to use this quote, Easter, that idea of the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness. When we get to that text that talks about Jesus coming to his disciples in the evening, remember the first thing he does? He, he, he even before he speaks, do you remember what he does? Maybe you need to look it up. I'm I'm not going to talk anymore about this because I I'm pretty sure this is going to be one of my Easter sermons. Moralism confines goodness to the region of law and duty, which never lets us feel in our face the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness. You want to think about that more and how 
we have an example of the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness, then then start getting ready for Easter and read that story about Jesus appearing to his disciples on the evening when he rose from the dead. And um, I think on that a little bit. Uh, maybe you can write my sermon for me. <laughs> anyway, uh, a couple of quotes I wanted to share with you today, uh, some of my favorites from the last couple of weeks. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. God bless you all.